A common thing that I noticed with software engineers, especially coming from a more academic background and trying to get into industry, is the focus on like this theoretical perfection of building software. I wanted to create this video to talk through why that's not really the thing to focus on when you're trying to work in the industry. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a principal software engineering manager at Microsoft. What I meant in the introduction is not that you should avoid trying to write good code. I just mean that focusing on perfection is not going to be the answer. So in this video, I wanted to go look at someone else who's very popular in the industry, creates a ton of amazing content, and you probably know who it is. And that's the Primogen. He has this video that talks about building software and basically reaching a point in the life cycle where it's eventually going to have to be rewritten. Let's go check it out, and I'll give you my thoughts as he's going through it. Code bases survive because there's one engineer that has the foresight to be able to write code that's at like the 90th, the, the, you know, the 90th through the 90th percentile of skill and ability. Okay. This one engineer puts a bunch of stuff on rails, uh, then quits because he's like, peace out. I got better. I got, I got better money somewhere else leaves and then a bunch of you know then a bunch of the people that are remaining just take this and keep running with it and to and just to call it out he's going to explain it in just a moment but like you don't always get this right there's it's not always that you had someone that was in that 90 to 99th percentile sometimes and a lot of the time it's mostly average developers right the likelihood of getting someone who is in that really top percentile to go work through and create the beginning of a project it's rare. Ideally, you have people like that. They can kick these things off, but it's not always the case. So this is the sort of like best case scenario, but let's keep going. Till it just absolutely goes off the rails and then things do not work any longer, right? Like this is just software engineering 101. If you don't think this is the case, wait until you, you find out, wait till you do it. LLMs is like being able to take code that's generated right out of the, you know, right out of the median, right? And so you're not getting your software developed by this person and putting the rails on here, you're actually getting the software and putting the railing on by this person, which means that your expected lifetime on your software is going to be like this. You're going to be like, oh yeah, it's working. And boom, it's going to just, it's going to suck. It's just going to suck. Whereas the other one, it still crashes and burns. Like this guy didn't have all the foresight in the world. It's going to go, it's going to go, and then maybe it crashed. And that's a really good point too, right? So he was talking about someone who was kicking off this project, right, laying the foundation, being in this really high-end percentile of software engineers. And he said, this guy or girl, right, did not have all of the foresight to go make this perfect. He just drew it, showing you, like, it might have gone on longer, but at some point they couldn't have predicted everything in the future, especially when we're building software today, there's a lot of requirements and things that are changing. There's going to be technology changes. There's all sorts of stuff that makes it basically impossible to predict everything. And that means at some point in the future, your version of ideal might not be ideal anymore. Therefore, you have this drop off. So let's keep going. This is burns. But man, that distance right here, this is the difference between your startup making it and your startup not making it. <laughs> And we'll pause again, because this is a very critical piece of information, especially if you are going into a startup or small company. If you're going into big tech, you may not feel this as much. And that's, I think, just a side effect of some things in big tech, depending on your team and organization, moving a little bit slower. You do have the entire support of the organization. Like if one project fails, a lot of the time, not the end of the world, right? There's usually many, many, many big projects going on in big tech. There's lots of sort of like bets being placed on different things to build out. Of course, you might have something that you're working on that is a very large impact and doesn't work, right? That could have a big impact. But because the amount of projects being done across an entire organization is so many, generally one project isn't the end of the world. Now, at a small company, so the complete opposite, you do not have the luxury of working on so many things in parallel. And that means if you have a small company and one of your big projects is not going to be able to land or it's going to crash and burn early or you spend too much time trying to build it. Like, I know the graph is talking about this drop off, this catastrophic failure of the project, but you could have the same type of issue that if you spend far too long trying to build it and make it perfect before it even launches, you're going to have a drop off that's like this. It's not because the 
you know, the system that you built crashed and burned, it's because the company crashed and burned because you didn't ship anything. So there is an important balance to strike here. Let's keep going. Okay, learn to code. Take your time. Become good. The best way to learn how to code is to create crappy projects. That's it. It's that easy. Create a project, scale it until it completely fails. Create another project, scale it until it fails. You just need to you need to do that like 15 times because then you see I can write a code, I can write code such that it will work for a while. You know, maybe it works like it, maybe you could write code that is right for like six months. If you could write code that's right for six months, that is incredible. And we'll pause again. The very first part that he said once I unpaused last time was the best way to get good at it is to keep writing code. And he specifically calls out crappy code, right? It's going to be code that fails. And that's okay. One of the best ways that we learn is through our failures. So a lot of the time when I have people coming to me and they're saying, hey, I'm just getting started, like, you get this all the time, right? What's the best book to read? Like, what should I start focusing on? What's the best language? Like, a lot of that's going to be really just either how you learn, like the language, the infrastructure, the tech stack you pick. That's going to be very heavily geared towards the area that you just like to develop in, but there's no best. When it comes to the sort of best way to learn and the best way to get good at building software, as Prime is saying here, like, you need to be able to put in the time. You have to try building things. You have to end up failing for yourself to see where these things happen. And it sucks because we want to turn to other people and say like, you've gone through this, tell me all the shortcuts, but it doesn't really work like that. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to go through these steps and learn for ourselves. Now, one of the really awesome parts about doing this is that you can try building stuff out, following different architectural patterns, you might, um, you'll hear about over abstracting and maybe not even putting enough abstractions in, but generally over abstracting, like I'm really bad for doing that in my own hobby projects. It's spending too much time trying to plan like, oh, I'm going to make sure that I can prevent this case in the future, right? So you go through this a couple times where your stuff is failing and you start to over index the other direction and saying, okay, well, if I, I might have to switch the database out, like I'm going to make sure that everything I do makes it so I can swap out the database and oh the front end could change so let me abstract that you abstract so much that instead of even getting the thing delivered you have basically just a ton of abstractions hard to navigate code and you might not have even shipped the thing so there is this balance to strike and going through this sort of process of building things seeing them fail or kind of like reach a point where you're like we can't scale it it's such a good exercise for you to try and reflect and say like, what were the things that made that happen? And throughout your different experiences, start to pick up on the patterns that you want to look out for in the future. So let's keep going. Like, honestly, that's incredible. That means you had enough foresight not to over abstract, write the right interface, and it just works. Like, that's good. That means you're, that means you're, you're improving. If you think you can write code that will never need to be rewritten, you're writing quick sort or you're diluted. Okay, and there you have it, right? Um, so I wanted to talk about this too because uh, like, I have a course on refactoring. This is probably a good opportunity to plug that, right? So I do have this Dome Train course on refactoring, but something that I talk about in this course is like when you need to consider rewriting versus refactoring. And this is incredibly important because we do have refactoring techniques that let us massage the code to be able to get it to a point where we can keep extending it, you know, trying to bring in flexibility. Maybe you wrote something that's really brittle and you need to be able to, um, you know, refactor it so it can be testable, all these sorts of things. We have stuff that we can keep applying to like massage the code and try to get the lifetime to extend with it. But generally, if your code base is living for long enough, you have paying customers, right? And the requirements and stuff are changing. Things are just evolving in the system that you're building. At some point, it's very likely, maybe not all of your entire system or all of the different components have to be rewritten, but certainly parts of it likely will. And that's just because it's basically impossible to, like I said earlier, to plan for every possibility in the future, especially if you have changing customer requirements and you have to end up supporting your customers, right? So I wanted to, to mention the refactor versus rewrite part because there are ways that you can do like incremental rewrites on portions of things 
there may be situations where based on the technology stack you pick maybe it's become uh you know obsolete in the sense that the the people supporting it are no longer continuing it you might go oh crap we have a bit of an end of life with our tech stack we need to start considering rewriting these things because we're not going to have support there's outstanding bugs in the infrastructure for it all that kind of stuff so it can and likely will come up where you need to balance these things. So I do try to touch on that in the course, but I thought the way that Prime talked about it was important too, right? So I think the way he phrases it, to, in my opinion, is a little bit more extreme than I might phrase it, but I, I do think it's accurate that you should expect that at some point in time, code you've written will be rewritten, right? It might be obsolete, it might be rewritten. Along the way, it might be refactored and I like to look at refactoring itself as like a bit of a spectrum, right? Where we can do refactoring that's like not changing behavior. That's typical definition. But at some point you start to refactor maybe a little bit too heavily where you're technically starting to rewrite different parts of your code. So there is a bit of a sliding scale in my opinion, but I do think that it's sort of inevitable. It's either that your software will crash and burn or you will be finding ways to start rewriting pieces of it to keep it alive or rewriting the entire thing. If you're interested in seeing how on a new project, I go about approaching how much to invest up front versus later on in deferring some of these design decisions, you can check out this video next. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.